Thank you. 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 Okay. Assalamu alaikum, Alala. Wa alaikum assalam. Thank you. Clearly, the GSB is very excited to have you here today. Um, before we start, I want to just say a personal thank you, Malala. As a fellow Pakistani, um, a brother to two sisters, a son to a mother back in Karachi, is I'm humbled and filled with gratitude to share the stage with you today. Thank you so much, and I'm also honored to be here. Thank you so much to everyone for your presence, and I'm so excited to have this conversation. Great. Um, there are a lot of important topics we have to cover today. We don't have too much time. I want to start with one which is very important to the both of us. Yes. That's cricket. Yes. <laughs> um, have you been following the World Cup in the last week? Yes, I, I always follow cricket, and I even like I would watch any league, any any match that is to do with cricket. And I watch test matches as well that are five days long. Um, but T20 is, is the shortest, you know, in the international ones. And Pakistan is doing really well this time. <laughs> it started with India. Then we beat them. Then New Zealand, again, we won. And today it was Afghanistan. We won again. Um, I think in the last two overs, a lot of people had given up and they thought Pakistan <laughs> was going to lose. But I had full faith. That Pakistan <laughs> was going to win today, and my intuition is never wrong. So. Oh, wow. There you go. Um, great. So let's perhaps start with Pakistan. Um, before you were even 10 years old, back in Swat, um, you were a loud advocate in your community for girls' education and girls being in school. That's not, I would say, typical of a 10-year-old girl uh, in Pakistan. What made you do that at that early age? I think uh, you know people often time hear about my story and they are surprised that I was speaking out for my right to education at age 10, 11. Um, and it is an unusual story, but also uh, this was the case because what I was experiencing was unusual for girls. And that was because uh, at that time, the Pakistani Taliban had entered Swat Valley uh, in 2007 they started spreading this ideology of establishing the so-called like Islamic state. And uh, they wanted to bring in their own so-called Sharia system. Uh, and they, um, you know, they wanted to like, Pakistan was already an Islamic country. So like, how do you make another Islamic country inside and in, in, in an Islamic country? But then along with that, they also had this narrative against women. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know they carry a very patriarchal mindset. As soon as they entered, they banned women from going to markets. They banned women from having any profession, uh, from going to work. They would not allow them to go outside their houses without, you know, wearing a full shuttlecock burqa. And you had to have a custodian with you. You know, it could even be like your little brother. And I remember like my mom or me or any woman like going outside. Uh, you know, to see a doctor or somebody. And they would have like these little boys with them. And I would, uh, you know, I would always question like, how's this little boy going to protect me, right? Like they can't. Instead, I'm protecting them. Um, <laughs> but at that time, they also announced a ban on girls' education. Uh, and uh, I could not go to school. My friends could not go to school. So I had no choice uh, but to speak out for my right to go to school. And I want to touch on the role your father played, Ziauddin. Um, you've spoken about him previously. Um, how much of an influence was he um, in that upbringing at that early age, um, especially when it comes to education? Uh, I'm really proud of my dad. He uh, is, is a proud feminist. And he saw that his own five sisters could not get their education. Uh, and they, uh, you know, they did not have access to a future that he had. And he knew that his life was different because he was a boy, nothing else. Gender played a role in deciding the destinies of, of the siblings. And he was really passionate about uh, bringing equality into society. So he decided that when he has his own children, he would ensure that they're not discriminated based on their gender. And uh, you know, he has always loved me, and uh, he um, 
you know, he has been a proud dad. He has encouraged me to believe in myself. And I always tell people that my story is not an exceptional story. It could have been the story of any girl if their fathers and their brothers had allowed them to speak out. Many were stopped by their family members. Many were stopped by men in the society. What's different in my story is that my father did not stop me. Hmm. So, um, and that's what he says uh, when you ask him, you know, like, what did you do for your daughter? He says that, like, don't ask me what I did, but ask me what I did not do, and I did not clip her wings. So it's a message to women and girls all, all around the world that, you know, that they don't need any sort of superpower or anything special to go ahead in their life. There are so many barriers in front of them that makes it more difficult for them to go ahead. So we need to fight against those barriers, the glass ceiling, the iron bars uh, in their way. And men have a role to play in that. So um, for me, like my dad has always been supportive. And um, I have always you know, been this sort of like, I like giving advice. So I'm always there <laughs> telling my dad how things should be and what we should do. You know, when you're like a kid and you, you know, that's your thing and that's how you talk to your family members. So I have carried it on since then, but he always listens. Uh, he's, he's a great dad. Great. And just um, on your father, um, I read somewhere that he also named you Malala. It's a beautiful name. Can you tell us more about the story behind your name? Uh, so um, Malala means uh, grief stricken, basically in Pashto. Uh, but the name has a more historical meaning as well. And it was the name of this Afghan heroine, Malalai of Maywand. And she came from this Maywand area in Afghanistan. And her story is, goes like this, that there was the second Anglo-Afghan war and the Afghan soldiers were uh, losing that battle and they were leaving the battlefield when this uh, young woman went to the mountain top and she raised her voice and told the soldiers uh, that if you do not die on this battlefield today, you will live your life in shame forever. And her voice was so powerful that all the soldiers returned and they fought that war and, uh, and they won. Uh, you know, it's, I think it has meaning, it has more meaning in our, in our culture. And uh, she is probably the only uh, Pashtun hero that we have who is known by her own name. And so my father was just really proud of her, and he wanted to name me after somebody who, had, who was known by her own name. Right. And I think that's beautiful, just based off the life you've lived so far, and how it mirrors Malala and, and I know that story. So let's perhaps just move on, um, fast forward a few years. You're 17 years old now. This is late 2012, early 2013, after the Taliban attack. You're um, recovering, the months are rolling by, you're in a different country, you're in the UK. Um, take us back to that time and, you know, it's a time of, you know, helplessness, of despair, you've gone through such a lot. How did you think about what you wanted to do next in your life? And kind of just put us in that position and how did you think about that? So when I was in the hospital, I had no idea that I was receiving so much support from around the world. I was not seeing any television, any mobile phone, and uh, I was going under, uh, you know, all the healthcare and treatment. And then one day, this uh, staff member at the hospital brought this basket of cards and letters. And I was opening those cards and reading messages from people um, from all over the world. You know, a letter from a five-year-old girl to a letter from an eight-year-old person in the US or in Japan, and I was completely amazed and surprised that uh, people had heard my story and they were sending their prayers and they were sending me even like gifts, like you know, from shampoo to <laughs> scarves to shoes to anything you could possibly think of. And you know, I, was, I was completely amazed, and then the staff member told me that this is just one box. There are like <laughs> so many boxes there with us. You have received thousands and thousands of cards from people from all over the world. That's when I realized that I, uh, you know, I can uh, speak out for girls globally. I, you know, the Taliban tried to silence me, but you know, they made a huge mistake because I am in a position <laughs> where I can not only speak about my right to education and girls 
and for girls in Swat Valley, but I can speak out for girls globally. And since then, it has been my mission to ensure that all 130 million girls who are out of school can have access to education. That's beautiful. So that's the mission, the 130 free, safe, quality education um, for girls around the world. How did you come up with the idea of a fund or a foundation? Um, you know, who kind of, who helped you, who guided you at that early age? Did you just kind of walk us through that process of why the fund was the best vehicle um, to achieve that mission? Um, so I'll be honest, when I, you know, when I started this foundation, I wasn't really sure how these things worked. I was, I think, 16 years old. Uh, I was also studying. I was, um, I was a bit behind in my studies because, uh, because I had missed a few years uh, because of my treatment. So I had, I, I had to do my homework, and I had to uh, be in school, and then I had to do these events uh, because I was invited to different places. And then I started a foundation as well called Malala Fund. And initially when I was asked, what do I want to focus on? And uh, I said, you know, on, on girls' education, I want all girls to be in school. And that's what I want to work for. But then they said, no, no, like you have to be a bit more specific. Do you want to work, you know, in this country or that country? And do you want to like build schools or do you want, like so many questions. I was like, no, like I want to do everything. I want <laughs> all girls to be in school. I can't pick. <laughs> so this has been the mission uh, uh, for us since then, that we fight for all girls who are out of school. And we currently work in more than eight countries, including Pakistan, Nigeria, Brazil, India, Afghanistan, um, Lebanon. And um, our mission is to ensure that we work with local uh, activists and we support the local-led projects that address the issues and the barriers that girls face in their uh, right to education. So it could be from like training female teachers to changing legislations to addressing social norms and engaging the local communities. And the work has been remarkable when you work with local activists because they identify the problems, but they also identify solutions to those problems. That's great. You mentioned earlier studying. Um, and you graduated from Oxford last year yes. in the summer. But you've been an activist well before that, you know, before Oxford, back in Swath, and since, um, you know, the, the attack as well. What did you get from that classroom education? Um, I believe you read PPE at Oxford. What, how did that classroom education over those three years change your view on how to approach this problem and just your approach and ad advocacy and activism compared to what you knew before? Um, I'll be honest, when I was studying at university at Oxford, um, you know, education was still important to me, but it was not a priority because <laughs> they tell you that, you know, you, you learn uh, a lot from your textbooks and from your lectures, but you also learn a lot from meeting people and socializing with people. Uh, and I will be honest, I met incredible people there. I made amazing, um, you know, friends and I, I'm, I'm friends with them now forever. And I also got the opportunity to engage and interact with incredible professors and um, and you know these amazing intellectual people whose you know books I'd be reading for my essays so uh, it, it's it's just great to have that opportunity and then like Oxford is just so beautiful so you spent a lot of time in the beautiful gardens and libraries there and uh, you spend amazing time with your friends and then you go through essay crisis and then <laughs> you are you are you are awake the whole night just to finish your essay that you left to the last date. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's your fault, and every week you are just depressed. Why did you, did the, why did you do this to yourself again? <laughs> but it happens, uh, and then you, know, you don't regret having all those incredible experiences. So you're like, fair enough, and then you submit your essay <laughs> and go back to sleep at 8 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> I'm sure there are many people here who can relate to that experience. Yes. So you shouldn't be so hard on yourself. Um, <laughs> I want to go back to the fund's mission. Um, 130 million girls um, who you want to get back into school, K through 12. This last few months in the last year has been difficult for that mission on a number of different reasons. Um, perhaps let's just go back to August of this year, um, the Taliban recapture of Afghanistan. How did you receive that news? How did it sit with you? What was your initial reaction, having already lived through that you know, nine years previously? 
Um, no one expected the Taliban to take over Afghanistan, no one. And I remember just like two weeks before the Taliban took over Kabul, I had a call with all the activists that we were supporting in Afghanistan, like our, our education champions there. And some of them still had hope that, uh, that, you know, that Afghanistan can never fall into the hands of the Taliban. And uh, they, uh, so, you know, just like everyone else, the whole, you know, the whole world was shocked. I was shocked as well to see that, uh, that the Taliban were now in, uh, you know, in, in the whole country and they were ruling over, over people. And, you know, I think it, it's again uh, a gloomy time for women and girls there. And we already see the impact of that. Women have lost the opportunity to walk freely to their job places. Many of them have not returned to their workplace. And girls at this time uh, are not sure if they can go back to schools or not. The Taliban announced, uh, I think, 43 days ago that boys can return to schools, but they did not give any clear statement on whether girls can return to their schools or not. So, uh, you know, we started then a, a petition together with Afghan activists, and uh, uh, it's on uh, awaz.org, and we are asking the Taliban to immediately let girls be in schools. We're also asking G20 leaders and the Muslim countries to take, uh, you know, a bold stand for this. They must protect the rights of girls and they must protect the right to education for girls. Afghanistan right now is the only country in the world where girls are not allowed to be in school. And just on that issue, Malala, sometimes it's difficult for us to, you know, visualize the 130 million girls who are not in school. We're, where you're at Stanford in California, you know, dare I say, much, very much a bubble compared to the issues um, that we're all seeing on the front lines. Can, can you help us understand why is this not just a women's or a girls issue, but an issue for everyone? And this is not something that, you know, countries in another part of the world need to worry about, but this is truly a global issue for everyone around the world. I think firstly, we need to remember that the Taliban uh, government in Afghanistan right now is, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a forceful uh, government. It's not by the choice of the people of Afghanistan. They had no say in this. Uh, the Taliban have captured that, uh, you know, those cities by force, uh, even, even though they claim that they have not, uh, you know, fired their guns, but they still were holding guns on their shoulders and they still had their clash and cops on their shoulders. So they are using power, they, all u they, are, they are using uh, their, 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 you know, their military power to uh, suppress people, to force people to accept them. Uh, but also they are, you know, they, uh, they're, they're denying people their basic human rights and they're not very clear about that. They are giving very vague uh, statements on protecting the human rights of people. So I think you know, this, is, this is the time that all the world leaders who speak about protecting humanity and who speak about standing up for human rights, that they stand up for the rights of the people of Afghanistan. And uh, it's really important for them to protect the rights of women and girls, to protect the rights of minorities especially, uh, but also ensure that all the humanitarian assistance and aid is provided to people there we know that the presence of the Taliban has impacted the, the lives of people, but there's also uh, you know, other issues like COVID and, and severe drought as well. So those issues cannot be denied either, like it's going to a stage of famine as well. Uh, and, and these are issues that must be uh, considered. So you know, this, is, this is what our advocacy and our activism is asking for leaders to, to, to act soon. And you mentioned advocacy, activism, Typically, those are, you know, that's work done by the government, by the nonprofit sector, uh, by foundations, and so on. A lot of us here will graduate from the GSB and enter the business community and the private sector, potentially. What is the role of businesses in the private sector um, in partnering in various ways in solving this problem? I think, you know, this is, this is a question and this is a challenge, and, uh, um, you know, I don't have answers uh, to, to all of these questions, but I will say that everybody has a role to play in 
uh, in showing support to those who do not have a voice right now, who do not have the support that they need. A lot of people right now in Afghanistan need safety, and there have been uh, you know, many organizations, including like businesses, who have helped in the evacuation of so many people. So I think the top priority is to ensure that the people in Afghanistan, especially the activists who are, uh, you know, who are under threat from the Taliban, that they receive safety and protection. And uh, you know, we, we did that for our activists in Afghanistan and for other families and a lot of other organizations and government officials have done that for many families there. So that, you know, that, is a, uh, that is essential. But along with that, we also need to explore other ways in which we can use you know, our expertise and resources to make um, education more accessible for children in Afghanistan. And I think you know, this is something where business community can help. How can we use uh, the, you know, the technology that we have to ensure that education is given to girls in Afghanistan in other ways rather than formal schooling? Um, and along with that, I think you know, still like humanitarian assistance and support is needed, and businesses have the opportunity to, to support the work that is happening th there uh, for uh, the safety and protection of people, for um, um, you know, ensuring that they're given their basic needs. Uh, so again, like there, there are so many ways in which people can help, but it also requires like, you know, collective effort to, to think through this and, uh, and also like, engage the people of Afghanistan in these conversations. You mentioned technology. Um, I believe you recently had a partnership announced with Apple uh, based here in Silicon Valley. Tell us more about what's the vision behind that partnership with Apple? Uh, so um, with Apple, um, you know, Malala Fund has been working over the past many years and Apple has supported our projects. So it was also, you know, covering the work that we are doing in Afghanistan and then other countries like Nigeria, India, Pakistan. And we run this uh, activist program, which is called Malala Fund Education Activists. And we have, I think, more than 50 activists in, in all of those countries right now. And they are working on addressing the, the problems that girls face in their, in their local communities. For instance, like when COVID started, um, our activists in Nigeria, they conducted a research straight away and they were looking at the impact of COVID-19 on girls' education. And they realized that girls miss out on their education because they don't have access to digital tools. Uh, they are also more, um, you know, they're also more likely to be forced into marriages when they are stuck in their houses. And they also could be supporting their families financially or in the, in the household chores. And uh, so then they, uh, our activists, they started doing lessons through radios. So they would ensure that, you know, even if, they, even if the girls cannot attend their schools because of COVID, they're still learning their lessons through radio. And that is the best, um, you know, form of technology in those areas. Like other technological devices and tools may not work. And uh, so, you know, that is just one example of how they are just ensuring that children do not miss out on education and they keep on learning. So Apple has, you know, they are one of our biggest supporters and, uh, and it's great to, to work with them. That's great. So that's an example of, you know, your time commitments, your priorities, partnering with Apple and um, you're obviously you know, you travel around the world, do a bunch of speeches, you're meeting students, you're also at the grassroots level, um, you know, visiting refugee camps and schools and so on. As you think about your personal time, where do you feel your own time is best used in that fight against getting the 130 million girls back into school? What's most important for your time? I think, like, I'm, I'm always there uh, when my voice is needed. And I was uh, very fortunate that I got the opportunity to visit countries and to join girls who needed their voices to be heard. I have been to Nigeria, Iraq, Lebanon, Jordan, and uh, I have you know, met incredible girls who are fighting for their right to safety and, and education. And many of these girls have faced displacement and they have seen wars and conflicts in their hometown and they are living in, you know, in refugee camps or informal settlements, but they have not given up on their dreams. Often time, like I'm expected to inspire them, but it's, it's the other way around, like they inspire me and, and everyone else uh, you know, who, who, uh, who are joining us. And like, I, I remember there was one girl I met, her name was Najla in Iraq, and she was a Yazidi girl. 
and her family uh, you know, were decided that she should get married. She was only 14 years old, and she was in her wedding dress. Uh, and on that day, she decided that she does not want to be forced into marriage. She does not want to miss out on her education. So she took off her high heels, and she ran away to protect herself from that. And then um, you know, later on, when she came back, she tried to convince her father and her family to allow her to be in school, and she started going back to school. But then when ISIS came into her hometown, they had to evacuate again. And now, when I met her, she was in this informal settlement. But she was still passionate about learning and getting her education. And I saw that she was carrying a dictionary with herself. Where, uh, you know, she, and, and I asked her, I said, why do you carry a dictionary with you? She said, I want to like learn a few words every day. So this is the passion that girls carry for education and learning. And despite all the difficulties that they face from walking for long distances and not having all the resources like books and, and, and teachers, like they still are committed to uh, re receiving their education. And, uh, you know, they're, um, and it was Najla is, Najla is incredible. Uh, then she also like came to uh, the U.S. and she spoke at the U.N. platform and she shared her story. So my goal is to meet these girls but also uplift their voices so like leaders listen to them rather than me. And this is my goal in every meeting that, that I go to is that the activists and girls are with me. Uh, and you know I introduce myself but I'm like, let's listen to Najla, let's listen to these activists. Um, and they have something to say to you. You have, not been, you have been ignoring their voices. So hear from them, and they will tell you what the issues are in, in this country for girls and women. That's beautiful. Just hearing the stories themselves is a lot more powerful um, than advocates and so on and so forth. Previously, you've also mentioned uh, potentially um, interest in politics. Is that still on the roadmap? What kind of what's, now that you're done with Oxford, what's next? Uh, no, not yet. No, no interest in politics. Uh, I think, um, you know, it's I th like when when I said that I wanted to be the prime minister of Pakistan at that time, I was 12 or 13 years old, <laughs> and I was really disappointed with the role of our political leaders because what was happening in Swat was was just taking so long, and for me it was just absurd that no one would take any action. Uh, and as days went by, and I thought, like, girls in South Valley cannot go to school. There is a conflict. Our schools are bombed. We hear firing, like, every night. We, we are having sleepless nights, and, our, like, we are under threat. And no one does anything, and it happens for two years. So at that time, I said, okay, like, fine, I asked you guys. You didn't do anything, so I'll, I'll one day become the prime minister, and I'll fix it. But you know, then you know, I, I'm, I was really fortunate that I have so much experience, and I have met so many amazing and incredible people, and I have been able to visit so many like projects. Um, I know that you know the world is a bit more complex, but um, you know, you can bring change in many ways. You don't have to be a politician to be a change maker. You can bring change in any role that you take in your society, from becoming a doctor, engineer, business person to a politician or to a human rights activist, all of these opportunities gives us um, some, some ways in which we can contribute to the change that we want to see in the world. So I hope to continue my activism and ensure that we see that day when all girls can go to school. Right. And on the topic of change in many ways, there's this wave of young activists um, in the last few years, and it's very refreshing to see uh, you know, the younger generation standing up and having their voices heard. Different activists, advocates have different styles in how they engage with um, the issues that they're tackling, the community. How would you describe your style? Where does that come from? How, like, what, what brings that out in you? I think for me, there are a few rules that I follow in my advocacy. One is that my voice and my words should reflect me and who I am and what my values are. So, and then along with that, it's also important for me that whatever I say is the truth. So as long as you are speaking uh, you know, the truth and as long as you are yourself, then you know, that should be your, you know, your form of advocacy. But I also think that we are all in like, different positions and in different places. 
And you know, some of us want to work from the inside, some of us want to work from the outside. And I think you know, we all have a role to play and we are all like helping each other. So I do not underestimate or undermine the activism that other people are taking in different forms. I think it's incredibly powerful. Uh, and, um, and you know, like all the activists should just realize that they're all on the same side. <laughs> they're all on the same side and they must support each other because that helps them in achieving their goal. They have a lot more in common uh, and they must not lose focus on the issues that they want to address and the change that they want to bring. So I, you know, in the education field or in other uh, fields when there is activism happening, um, you know, I, I appreciate the role of every person in there. And speaking about different types of activism and different causes and so on, you know, the Malala Fund in your vision is for girls' education. But there are so many other um, issues, injustices, reported in the media, some not even mentioned in the media, happening all around the world. Given your voice, your platform, Malala, how do you think about when to speak up and when not to? There are some issues that have impacted me and that have been part of my story. And I think you know, I should be speaking out about those issues. And you know, that issue includes uh, girls' education. I speak out for girls' right to education all over the world. Uh, but then I also speak out about uh, what is happening like, you know, in, in parts of Pakistan and Afghanistan because we had also been uh, part of that long, uh, decades-long terrorism that the people have faced there. Uh, whether it's the Pakistani Taliban or Afghan Taliban, they, have all, uh, they all carry the same ideology and the same acts, and uh, we all have, have been their victims. So I speak out about that as well. And I speak out about the issues that impact girls' education. Uh, but there are other issues as well in which um, you know, it, it connects to girls' education and my mission. But sometimes like, I'm not the best person to speak out for that. There are so many other people who have expertise in that. And I ensure that the platform is theirs and I support them. Uh, so you know, there are many things which I do not speak out about uh, because I just want to ensure that um, you know, that my voice is, is, is for girls' education and that is understood that this is my mission and this is what I will, uh, I will use my voice for. Okay. Yep. You know, you're, you're traveling around the world. Um, you're, you used to be a student as well. You're juggling a lot of different things. We see you on TV and in the news uh, very often. Like, how do you think about work-life balance and just personal health? Like, <laughs> is work and life, is there even a blur or... Is there a balance there? Um, I, I would say it was very difficult when I was in school because you know, I, I, I used to have homework like every day and I had to attend my classes from like 8 a.m. till 4 p.m. in the UK. So it was quite challenging and I remember one time I had a flight to Norway to attend some event and I think it was like over the weekend or something but I was arriving like the next morning, in the morning time. Uh, so I, I was like, I can't miss my school day. So I took my school uniform with me. And then on the way back, I, you know, I went straight to my school, changed you know, into my uniform, and, and, and I was like, I can't go home. I, I, I would miss my classes. So it was challenging, uh, but you know, it was important for me that I focus on my education, but also I give time to my activism for the education of all girls all around the world. Uh, but I had to focus on my education because, you know, if you speak out for education and don't focus on yours, you are, I think, missing the point. So. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, is, are there any like just day-to-day -day activities, mindfulness? Is there anything you do on a daily basis that kind of helps you stay um, committed to that work-life balance you mentioned? I really like you know staying in touch with my friends and talking to them. Uh, I I like spending time with people. It could be like you know our family friends and my own school friends or university friends, and I you know I like playing uh, games as well. At one point it was Among Us. If anyone had played it, <laughs> but then I I think we are all like done with that, right? We have moved on. <laughs> After that, um, I like playing cricket with my brothers and badminton, and I I watch TV shows as well. I have seen Squid Game, so. Oh. 
<laughs> the first <laughs> episode literally shocked me and I was like, <laughs> what is happening? But then after that, I think you get used to it. So <laughs> uh, that, was, that was good. And then in the middle, I had to like stop. I was like, okay, I need to switch to something else. So I went to Ted Lasso and he made me like <laughs> laugh and just realize, you know, like life is more positive and easy and yeah, but. <laughs> Got it. Um, I want to move on to, you know, there's a, on to just perhaps um, criticisms that you face. Um, and it's shocking to me personally, but given the work you're doing, the work you've done, and what you've been through, um, there's no shortage um, of pushback. Why do you think, um, where does that come from? Where, where, does it, where does it butt out from, that criticism? I think firstly it depends like what the criticism is and if we like, you know, clarify and explain that. But, you know, if somebody says that, you know, I should do this and not that and I haven't done enough for this or that. And like sometimes I have to remind people like I am not a government, you know, I, I don't have like trillions of dollars and I don't have a central bank <laughs> and, you know, I, I am not that person, but my goal is to use my voice and, and the resources I have to convince governments to invest in education, in women, uh, and, and ensure that, that the resources are allocated into the right areas that benefits our society, that empowers women and girls. Uh, but I think then there are also things like, you know, but, I, but my focus is always that I am working for girls around the world and their right to education. So I feel like I'm only answerable to myself and the people I have made commitment to, uh, to ensure that we make a, a better world. Other than that, like, you know, people can say anything, right? right. Um, and I think also like, you know, on social media, you see comments and things like that. And you would see like 20 positive ones and just one negative one. And then all our focus is on the negative one, right? We dismiss all the positive ones. Uh, but I think it's, it's important to remember that sometimes the social media world does not actually represent the real world that we live in. And I will say that um, so far, I have not seen anyone in person who has been hateful to me, who has uh, been, um, you know, like has said anything negative. They have always been supportive. And even if they have been critical, they have done it in a very polite way. Um, so I, I don't worry too much about that. That's great. Um, specifically, maybe lasering in on Pakistan. You visited since, um, since the attack. The pandemic has obviously made that more difficult. Um, what is your long-term kind of ambition uh, of, with Pakistan and you know, what you want to see there and the role you want to play there? Um, I hope I can go to Pakistan more often. And uh, I was planning to go already, but then pandemic things made things a bit more difficult. I have, uh, you know, we have been working in Pakistan uh, since we started Malala Fund. Our first project started from Pakistan, and that was uh, to announce this, this project, which was the education of 40 girls who were in domestic child labor. So to give them education, and they're still learning, they're still continuing their education. They are in like higher uh, grades now. And uh, since then, like we have now uh, done even like, you know, more and bigger projects since then. We have started a, a school in the hometown of my parents, Shangla. And Shangla is considered to be one of the most deprived and, and, and you know, uh, areas in, in, in Pakistan. It's a, it's a mountainous area, and uh, this is the first school there, first school for girls there, where girls can complete their secondary education. And like every year, we get hundreds and like thousands of applications. And we can only pick a few students, but what you realize is that when quality education is available, when the state of the art school is available, and when parents feel safe for their children to go to school, then like this, 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 the, the social norms and, um, and, and all, that st all that like stigma that's been associated with education for girls changes really quickly. And, uh, and we see so many families like sending their daughters to school and um, so you know, like the, the positive chain has already been seen. And along with that, we do our advocacy through the, through the Champions Project. And in Pakistan, we have uh, many, many champions and activists there who we are supporting in their work for girls' secondary education. That's great. What do you miss most about living in Pakistan? 
I, I miss my home. I miss, I miss Swat Valley and Shangla. Those are very beautiful places. And um, I miss my time with my friends. Um, yeah, and, and the food as well, of course, you know. I, I live in the UK, so <laughs> <laughs> I always miss the food. Got it. Um, so just before we kind of move on to you know, the audience questions, the mission and the vision, Malala, that you've taken on is vast. It's 130 million girls. You know, we hope it happens you know, as fast as possible. It will take multiple years, and it's a fairly long-term vision. How do you stay motivated on a day-to-day -day basis? Because in a, in a business sense, you can, you, know, you can win a deal and kind of see very tangible success on a regular basis. This is more long-term. How do you stay motivated on a daily basis? I think that inaction has worse consequences. Things remain as they are. So keeping uh, your work going is important. So staying active is important for me. And I believe that the work that we have done and the work that people in the past have done for women's rights and girls' education and the, and, and, and the work that all the organizations and everyone is doing uh, has brought us to this stage and ha has helped us see progress. So this work needs to continue, and we need to accelerate it, and we need to make it better, and we will see progress. What's, what's worse and what's, um, you know, what uh, I think is, is dangerous is, is us all giving up, right? So we should not give up. We should not stop this work. Uh, so we have to carry on. In action is complicity, yes. Um, the theme for our View from the Top Speaker series is Beyond Expectations. And we like to ask all our speakers, Malala, you know, what motivates you as a 24-year-old girl from Swat, Pakistan, to go beyond the expectations um, of you know, a girl from Pakistan? Um, I, I am uh, very ambitious. And I was like that in my childhood as well. And I would always question society and the world and why it could not be better than it is. Why do we see equality, inequality with our own eyes and don't do anything about it? Why do we see that like so many people live in extreme poverty? Why can't we change that? Why is it that millions of girls are out of school and nobody does anything about that? So I, and, but then on the other hand, I also remain ambitious that we can change that. We can see that change in our own life. And uh, um, so this is something that I have uh, taken with me from my childhood, is that you have to remain ambitious. And, um, and you, know, you have to be a bit more optimistic. So I, I remain optimistic and ambitious in my goals to see all girls in school in, you know, in my lifetime. Inshallah. Inshallah. Um, great. Let's open it up to audience questions. Um, I believe we have one. Right over. Um, hi, Malala. My name is Taleha, and I'm an MBA one here. As a fellow Pakistani woman, um, it is incredibly inspiring to see you Thank here. You. Thank you so much for coming here. Um, my question is, as someone who's personally navigated the challenges of a patriarchal society, I know there are millions of girls and women back home who personally face restrictions, whether it's access to education, whether it's professional opportunities, or even simply to have an independent opinion of themselves. On a more personal basis, what is your advice to them in terms of keeping hope alive for a more freer future? What was the thing for you that allowed you to continue staying so resilient in your difficult mm -hmm. times? Uh, thank you for that question. So I'll, I'll share one story. When I started um, you know, speaking out and my activism, I was only you know, 10 years old. But then as I was growing older and I was you know, at age 13 and 14, and especially like in our society in the north of Pakistan, uh, it's, you know, it could become uh, a taboo for a girl to be on a TV screen and, um, you know, and, and speak out to media publicly, not cover her face. And some families may completely oppose that. And I remember like one time uh, my dad asked my cousin to take me to this press conference area and you know, my cousin just felt extremely uncomfortable and then he told my dad that, you know, that Malala should not speak and my dad told him that this was none of his business. 
he should not be deciding anything for his daughter, and that everything that Malala does should be her own choice. So, but today, like that same cousin is the biggest supporter of my cause, and he's actually involved in, in the work, and he is so passionate about girls' education, and he supports me in my work. So, like initially, you would see this, um, uh, you know, this unease among people. You might even uh, hear, uh, you know, hateful comments, or you might hear people feeling just very uncomfortable to see women in different roles and in different positions, and women ha women having a loud voice and women being at the table. But with time, they'll get used to it, and uh, and you know, in in a few years, like before we know it. Things, things have already changed and things already become like customs and new norms. Uh, so it's important for us to remain uh, ambitious and, and committed and it's consistency is really important. So we have to stick to it and ensure that, you know, we, we, we carry this work on and, um, and hopefully, you know, things, things do change. We are already seeing so much progress in Pakistan. We have women in, in the parliament and we have women in different jobs and in different sectors and, uh, you know, hopefully, like, it, it will get better, it will improve, uh, and a lot of women are speaking out about, like, women's safety at work and in other spaces, and they're speaking out against, uh, you know, harassment and sexual harassment. So this is, there is, there is this uh, campaign going on for women's equality in Pakistan, and that gives us hope. Um, next question. Here. Hi, Malala. I'm Bruno, Hi. MBA one here from Stanford GSB. So first of all, I would like thank to you. thank you for sharing your thoughts, your brave story. Thank Definitely motivate us to make the world a better place. Thank well, I'm from a developing country in Latin America where education is not a right, it's a privilege. And I feel very privileged to be here at Stanford. Uh, as I know many boys and girls, they didn't have an opportunity to go to a proper elementary school in my home country, that is Brazil. So I would like to ask you, what, what are your thoughts about our role as students from top universities like Stanford, Oxford, to minimize the gap between basic education across the countries? Uh, thank you for that question. I think you, know, you are all uh, the future of uh, this world. You are all the future of your countries. And uh, I would say that remain ambitious about your goals. And you can, you can bring change in your countries. You can bring change in your communities. And you already might be a role model to so many young kids who may not have th thought about themselves uh, completing their school, going to a university, and taking a role in society. So you, know, you are already giving hope to so many people, um, so many women especially here who could be coming from developing countries or uh, from uh, you know, difficult backgrounds. They're giving hope to so many women and girls. And when, when a child sees somebody else in their dress, in their outfit, um, and, and you know, when they see somebody who looks like them, they, they can imagine themselves in that person's role. So you, know, you are already giving hope to so many. Another question? Yeah. Um, hi, Malala. So my name's Harpreet. I'm an MBA too. Um, and you may not remember this, but we met a long, long time ago. <laughs> um, Do you remember? So, in all fairness, Rustin, the reason she won't remember is because she'd suffered a very bad infection and she was in ICU after having just been shot in the head. The reason I remember is because I was your doctor at the time. Um, and I've followed your journey ever since, the difficulties you've had integrating new cultures, followed you through your new school in Edgbaston High, tried to be part of the Malala Fund when I was at McKinsey as well. Uh, I thought I was a natural fit. Um, <laughs> But I come from a family of strong feminists, and I've benefited from that as well. But I have seen a massive conflict in tradition versus progression and culture. And I know we've asked a similar question, but now that you've lived, like you've had the Pakistani experience, you've had the westernized experience, what do you think you can take from the experiences you've had in the Western world, and how do we take them back to areas where they could benefit? Um, thank you for that question, and you know, thank you for all your support, and nice to see you again. <laughs> uh, 
I think for me, like, uh, you know, when I, when I started living in the UK, there were so many things that, you know, surprised us. We were uh, living in cold weather forever. And, uh, you know, we were missing our nice, warm summer days in Pakistan. But other than that, you know, we, I started studying in a school where, uh, you know, we were getting quality education. That was the first time when I realized that education is not just about sciences and maths and learning English, but students also learn um, you know, cooking and sports and textiles. And these are not the subjects that you often see in schools in, in Pakistan. And it really challenges you to think about education in different ways in which you know, the goal is not to make somebody a doctor or engineer only, but to ensure that anyone uh, can go to that institution. They can explore their, um, their, uh, you know, their abilities, and they can explore uh, you know their their specialties, and then realize and and reach that, fu that their full potential. So when I when I was uh, you know studying in the UK, I realized that uh, you know education is is not just limited to like sciences and um, and and like maths and those subjects. Uh, but then also like along with that, you know there's a good health system, and um, you know you are much safer. And uh, but you know like your home is your home and you miss so many things about your home you know when you are with your friends and family and you are you know sitting uh, in your um, you know in 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 your uh, sort of dining room with your with your family friends and you are enjoying nice food and uh, you are surrounded by this beautiful valley and these lush green hills you are you are happy and you are still having like a joyful time so I think for us, like even though we were having all those facilities, we would still miss Pakistan all the time. Uh, what I, you know, I, I, and I have seen this in many places. People consider like the West to be sort of the standard of prosperity and development, and I think we need to sort of uh, challenge that a bit uh, it, because the pandemic and the recent events have exposed how the systems in many countries are not the ideal systems. They are still not favoring the most marginalized people in, in society. They are discriminating against people based on their income background, based on their skin color, based on their gender. Uh, so we need to like um, be a bit more critical of the system that we idolize. And uh, you know, it's possible for Pakistan and other countries to improve their systems. And, and, and this is a challenge for countries all over the world to improve their systems, to ensure that uh, they provide welfare to all its citizens, and it's based on a just and equal system. So nobody is left out, and nobody is treated unfairly. Great. Um, thank you for those questions. Before we end, Malala, we left to end with a lightning round. So I'll, I'll yes. share a phrase and just give me your quick thoughts um, okay. on those. <laughs> Ready? Yes. Yes, OK, perfect. <laughs> this one should be easy. Dead Lasso or Squid Games? Ted Lasso. <laughs> okay. So is that Apple TV over Netflix? Or is that... I mean, I'm partnering with Apple TV, yeah, you know, so it exactly. has to be Ted Lasso. So. It's the right answer. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, by the way, like I started a productions company, extracurricular, just for the context. <laughs> and we're partnering with Apple TV Plus. Uh, so yeah, it has to be Ted Lasso. <laughs> Favorite queer eye actor? I, I don't have any names. I'm so bad at names, so okay. you can you can suggest and I can pick one. No, Jonathan Van Ness, but no. No, no. I, I'm 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 bad at this. No worries. Yeah. No worries. No worries. No worries. The only name I I usually like when you talk about actors and actresses, like I know all the Bollywood ones, <laughs> um, and then like I know Brad Pitt and <laughs> Leonardo DiCaprio, and that's it. So. Okay. Uh, how about this one? A world figure who you have not met but want to. A world figure who I have not met but want to. Um, so it, it's, um, I, so, um, okay. It's not a politician. It's not a politician, but uh, I really want to meet Vanessa Nakate. She's a climate activist, and uh, I, uh, have been following her journey, and I would want to see her in person. Great. 
favorite social media platform? I, I, I mean, it has to be Instagram. <laughs> no, no. It, no, I think it's Twitter. I think it's Twitter. Okay. It's hard to pick, but it's between those two. Got it. Uh, sometimes it's Twitter. I mean, like, when anything happens, you, you want to go to Twitter, right? Just, just see tweets on it. And then Instagram is also good. Um, but yeah, like whenever I'm following cricket, I just go straight to Twitter and just <laughs> see what people have, have said. It's very funny. Same year, yeah. yeah. Um, where do you store your Nobel Peace Prize? <laughs> That's confidential, he'll never know. Confidential. <laughs> okay, great. And then last one, favorite Adele song? Um, I would say hello. 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 Great. Awesome. Well, Malad, this has been a lot of fun for Thank me personally you. and for Thank you as well, and we appreciate your time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. Um, Thank, and, you. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So nice to see you. Thank you. You can go this way. Thank you.